Okay, I just started started the recording. Last Sunday, I forgot to do it until Geo Geo joined us for a few minutes and reminded me to do it. Uh, is there anybody we want to uh, remember or, or uplift before we get started? I know uh, the past couple of Sundays, Charles had mentioned a young lady um, as a relative of his. I think she had been in an accident. Is that uh, a diving accident? Was that right? You can't remember her first yeah. name. A, di a diving it. accident. Yeah. Uh, I hope she's doing well. I think she's from the eastern part of the state, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and and, <clears throat> and jump in the lesson. And you guys, this is the third one uh, from the series. Uh, does everybody have this book? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the first lesson... Uh, we had was called um, what it is God the purpose of it was to explore what it means to be made in God's image and if you remember uh, the author listed uh, I don't know it was three or four um, traditional uh, meanings for uh, those interpretations they were a physical resemblance mental resemblance relationship to creation and human freedom but the author had his had his own uh, interpretation, um, and he, he meant being created in the image of God then is about humanity in relationship to God. <clears throat> and then last week, who, who can remember what we talked about last week? Of course, Dottie and uh, Jerry, it's up to you. You're the only two that were here. <laughs> <laughs> imitating Christ. Right on, right on. To explain how imitating Christ is an ongoing goal in Christian life. I was going to, let's see, the imitating, and, and uh, to sum that lesson up, uh, Jesus means, to imitating Jesus means emptying ourselves, humbling ourselves, and being obedient. Hey, Charles. Hey, Charles. Oh, he, he's connecting, he says. <clears throat> hey, Charles. Good morning. 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 How you doing? Morning. Charles, we were just talking about the young lady uh, uh, that you mentioned the last couple of Sundays that had been in the diving accident. Um, how, how is she doing? Have you heard any uh, any later news? I have not heard any more since uh, I called her dad uh, a couple of Sundays ago, uh, or not a couple of Sundays, but a couple of weeks, about ten days ago actually. And she okay. She she's she's doing better than she was expected to do so uh, uh there's there, there's real, there's real hope but uh she was in real dire situation there for a while sounds like it sounds like she, it. Well, she, next time she, you talk to her dad tell them, tell them we're thinking about her i Go will ahead. uh her she was very highly at risk of losing her life at, at one point so wow i'm glad this turned around for her I hope it continues. Uh, fortunately, she has uh, intelligence and uh, uh, and a college background uh, behind her. So there must be, and she's good from probably the head up. So and she just needs assistance. So there may be some things, bright things for her in the future. What she becomes comes out of this. We hope. Right. Right. No doubt. No doubt. Well, we're thinking about her and hope she continues to get better. One of the amazing, one of the amazing things is she had a, uh, she'd been a friend, male friend. And they're engaged since seventh grade. He he is wow. now he is now an engineer in Raleigh, and uh, he is and he is still supporting her. So uh, she followed she followed him to uh, East Carolina University. Okay. Great. I'm glad this working out and continues continues to improve and and get better. <clears throat> well, we just talked about the yes. I was gonna just mention that I think we need to remember Mark Sample's father in prayer yes. and you know and their family because uh, that that's tough now that the melanoma is in his bloodstream. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. So we. 
And Mark's a great guy. He'd do anything, do uh -huh. anything for anybody. So we want to remember him or, or keep him in our prayers. Okay. Well, we talked, just talked about uh, briefly what we'd been uh, studying the last couple of, of Sundays, uh, what it means to be in, made in the image of God, what it means to imitate Jesus. What about today? Does anybody know what the lesson is today? <laughs> you know I was going to give you a test, didn't you? Becoming <laughs> God's lesson? children. Yes. <laughs> God is trying to be the teacher's pet. <laughs> <laughs> You know I can't be quiet, so. <laughs> yeah, reading that book. Yeah, I'm looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, before next day. Sunday, Jerry, you got to hide the book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, the the background text today is from John, uh, chapter one, verses one through eighteen. The, the focal po point of the passage is ver or verses ten through eighteen. To affirm, and the purpose statement is to affirm that when we welcome Christ, he enables us to become God's children. Do, do you, and before we begin, I just I want to ask, ask the question. Do you consider yourself a child of God, and what do you think it means to be a child of God? What does it mean to be a child of God? Just what you mean. <laughs> you mean he watching over you, I think, that yes. you right. are, he is blessing you and taking care of you, and if you follow him, he's, he's going to be there. I mean, he's going to be there whether you follow him or not, but if you're, if you're there with him, if you follow him, he's, he's, you are his child. Right. What else? Any, anybody else? I can't believe no one said it meant you were a Methodist. I was expecting somebody <laughs> to say that it meant you were a Methodist, and, and, and nobody brought that up. <laughs> now you're you're correct. I think he's there with you, even if you, if you're not hadn't yet learned to follow him. So that would mean a lot more than just Methodist. So excellent. I'm gonna go ahead then and read John, chapter one, verses ten through eighteen. <clears throat> the light was in the world and the world came into being through the light. But the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen the, his glory, Glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> John testified about him, crying out, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. As the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, God the only son. Who is, the, who is at the Father's side, he has made God known. <clears throat> Have you ever heard, uh, I had ne I'd never heard this until I read this passage, as Jesus being referred to as the Word, chapter 14. I thought that was interesting. So, um, the, the text or the, the lesson starts out with the author. He was talking about um, saying Merry Christmas to a cashier in the grocery store. And it was, it was the, the odd thing about it was it was uh, after Christmas. It was around January the 6th. And he was still saying Merry Christmas. And he explained to the cashier when the, the cashier, of course, gave him a funny look. And he said that Christmas is a 12-day celebration. <clears throat> Usually... Uh, it actually begins uh, after sundown on Christmas Eve and ends on January 6th, which is the start of Epiphany. But now the author, is, is, uh, he's saying that after reading this passage, uh, he's, he thinks now it's a good time to say Merry Christmas all year round. 
and evidently he wrote this passage in the summer because he said he he's going to say Merry Christmas to folks even in the summertime. And he thinks he might get a lot of funny looks if, if he's doing that. But nonetheless, the importance of, of Jesus' birth uh, rings upon him. So again, and, and I'm going to tell those of you that are, are following along in, in the text, at the bottom of uh, page 26, uh, the evangelist, which is the traditional name for John, uh, the, the writer of the gospel, he pro pro proclaims that a new age is dawned with the birth of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, the word became flesh. Now, what, what do you think that means when, when we say the word became flesh? Who is, who is the word? Jesus. <laughs> but to me, it's almost as if we, we, uh, God's promises became flesh. We were able to see, you know, we were able to see God's promises come to, come to the earth. And he did that by what? Sending his son. Taking the form of Jesus. I mean, so which Jesus was. Yes, man. <laughs> That's what I was looking for, Charles. Thanks for backing me up. <laughs> Thanks for having my back. Yeah. I think Charles said that, so I would just go on and quit saying it over and over again. <laughs> uh, the Word has always existed and always held the cosmos together, but now the Word has come among us. Our God is not far off and detached. Our God has made his home among us, literally tended among us. Um, I think uh, Jesus' tent was actually a stable, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm going to skip down a, a little, and this, this gets into um, some of uh, other thoughts from, from John on page 27. But the great problem with our world, according to John, is that the world did not receive it. Jesus was, and he still is, met with indifference and hostility. Even his own people didn't welcome him. They went so far as to swap him for the notorious criminal Barabbas, Barabbas, Bar Barabbas, that's it, and shout, crucify, Barabbas. crucify. I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, 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 Barabbas? Barabbas? Barabbas, yeah. yeah. This, world, this was the world's great folly. And for this, John says the world is under judgment. The light came into the world, and people love darkness more than the light, and for their actions are evil. And then he goes on to talk about, uh, uh, John wrote this uh, gospel uh, a lot later than the others, <laughs> and mentions that he probably had more time to brood over this problem. So he, when he he developed a rich understanding of the role of John the Baptist and significance of Christ, of the Christ event in human history. John wanted to make sure that his readers no longer missed what God has done in the Word made flesh. So he wrote this gospel. And this is a quote from, from John. So that you will believe in that Jesus is the Christ God's Son and that believing you will have life in his name. So what do you think about those who have not seen the light? Just just think about that one. We'll come back to it. So the yeah, next I said, section. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, was just gonna, I was just going to say, you know, Christ is our role model. And I look at the world today and some of the role models. And, you know, some of the role models are criminals and you know, just, well, I, I can't get into all of it, you know, but it's just awful. I feel so sorry for the kids today, you know, uh, and many of them are not being in the church and look at the role models that they have, you know, too. It's just right. sad. I agree. Yes, yes. Okay, you guys, um, we got to straighten up. We've got another visitor. I just wanted to make sure that Faye got on, actually. I was worried because yes. we sat down earlier this week, and I got her set up with her bookmark, so I wanted to make sure she got on. I'm sorry to be late. Oh, yeah. 
Thank oh, you no so problem. much, Jill. Well, good. Thank you, Joseph, for yeah. doing this. And Joseph has agreed to do the Sunday school next Sunday, too. So y'all be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't have to wear a mask. I think we're six feet apart. Well, there's a bunch of people here this morning. So <laughs> I'm in and out of my office. So that's why. Yeah. You sure? You sure it's safe? <laughs> if you'll back up, back up from the monitor six feet, you'll be okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Sorry to interrupt. Y'all have a good day. No Bye. problem. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, so the next section. On, oh, I'm sorry. Dottie, were you done? Yeah, you I just, I'm that? just, you know, it just breaks my heart, you know, that, you know, we have the best possible role model but i'm really concerned you know today the lack of role models good role models right it's sometimes you know athletes become role models and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not i mean i'm not going to categorize all athletes as heathens <laughs> but sometimes they don't make the right choices but then you have another other athletes that do so then they're, they're not all like that. Right. But I can't or, imagine anybody not knowing knowing God is I think that we've been out of church as long as we have. If you'd have told me this time last year I wouldn't have been at church most of this year, I'd have thought you were crazy because <laughs> I mean right. this is good, but I miss my church and my church family. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree. I remember last um, October, November, I was watching the news, and that's about the time that uh, China started requiring their people to wear masks. Or uh, I think it was a requirement. I think they arrest, arrested people that didn't have masks. And I remember watching those folks going, and I remember thinking, there's no way I'm going to do that. There's no way I'm going to wear a mask. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, so, yeah. I'm with you. So, so have you ever heard someone talk about how they found Jesus? Perhaps they're expressing their relief in discovering his love for them. But should we, we should consider that the Gospels appear to be more of a story about how Jesus finds us than the other way around. Have you ever thought of that? I thought that was an interesting passage. Um, in many parts of Paul's writings, for example, Paul writes about how we have, we have been adopted by God. And John uses the term authorized. For those who welcome the true light and believe in Jesus' name, he authorized them to become God's children. These terms help us grasp, grasp at a mystery. Just how, exactly, just how exactly have we been received by God? John says that those who are authorized to become children of God did not receive their position as God's children by the nobil nobility of their birth. I, I want to pause there. There's like three three things that we're going to talk about in this section that um, describes how uh, how how can we be uh, become God's children or how are we uh, received as God's children? And then we can talk. And then the author goes into more detail as to whether or not he he agrees. So the first one is God did not children of God did not receive their position as God's children by the nobility of their birth. There are no blue bloods when it comes to spiritual birth. For example, the writer's children are preacher's kids, but even in a believing family like ours, they must be born of water and the Spirit themselves. So the first one is God did not receive their position by the nobility god's children didn't receive their position by the nobility of their birth <clears throat> now the second one is the children of god did not gain status through human desire he is simply saying that we do not join god's family by natural means as jesus told nicodemus whatever is born of the flesh is flesh and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit and then the last one john explains that we do not become children of god by way of our passion or the will of man. No other human being can make us God's children, not the church, not the pastor, no one. Neither can we will our way into being God's son or daughter. 
church rituals and ceremonies have their place, but they do not exactly authorize us to be God's children. As, as Paul wrote, it depends. It doesn't depend on a person's desire or effort. It depends entirely on God who shows us mercy. Yes, our status as children of God is given to us by God alone through the Spirit. But only God can receive the glory for this. And, and then he goes into an, another section where the author says he finds it curious that John actually says that God's children are born from God. Born from God, what, what a strange phase, phrase. But what about all the other people? Don't we say that everybody is a child of God? Does this mean they're orphans? We keep in, keep in mind something important about the literature from this period. And got, it was common for writers to use a literary form called dualism. That is, they would often divide the world and people into two or more categories and highlight the differences between them. Kind of like if you, I know you, you've probably heard people say there are two sides to every story or, or there's one way to peel an orange. Uh, that, that's very similar to the dualism. And John felt like there were two kinds of people, those who received Jesus and those who didn't. Those who get it and those who didn't. And this could have been because uh, John was part of a group, may have been part of a group of Jews who split off from the Jewish community, community when they started saying that Jesus was the Messiah. That might have upset some Jew, people in the Jewish community who started persecuting the Christians, and then vice versa. And this could explain John's harsh language about those who did not receive uh, Jesus. He wanted to define Christians apart from everyone else. The way John tells it, Jesus' own people didn't welcome him. They would put Jesus in the long and distinguished line. This would put Jesus in the long and distinguished line of prophets who brought God's message only to be rebuffed by the recipient. And perhaps it was even a, a credential or a badge of honor, honor for a prophet to be uh, rejected by the people. But nevertheless, Jesus came into the world by becoming flesh. His true light shined on all people. He made his home among us. He con contracted into a span so that we would know him. That's twice I've heard that phrase in, in, the, in, this, in the book, contracted to a span. You, what do we think that means? Take human form? <laughs> I had to look that one. I had to Google that phrase. Yeah. The word came to the people who thought who ought to have known him. The word who made the world was rejected by much of the very world he made. So to those who received him, he authorized them to become God's children. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, what, well, we kind of, we, well, we may have already talked about this one, but if you remember, there were the three ways uh, that we could become God's children, or that they also talked about becoming God's children. Uh, they are not, I'm sorry, there were three ways that we can't, we are not, we do not become God's children. Not by the nobility of our birth, not through human desire, the, which is the natural procreation process, and then not by the will of man. No other human being can, can make us God's children. What does it mean to be given the name child of God? What way has God been a father to you? That's a discussion. <laughs> it's, it's, a form of, it's, it's, a, it's a form of comfort uh, uh, since time I was baptized when I was 12, I've always felt that that part of my spirituality was uh, associated with uh, God and with Christ. And, uh, that, and my spirituality has never been something I really had to worry very much about. Right. Right. Were you going to say something? Well, I think sometimes, too, it's just accepting, accepting that grace and that love. It's, you know, we know it's there and we try to bring other people to that. 
that some days, um, you know, I'm, it's like I have to remind myself all over again that that grace and love and God is there for me because, um, you know, sometimes you get in the daily world, like you said, and there's so many negative influences. You have to remind yourself, I think of that, um, that you are a child of God and accept that. Um, because there are so many people who reject that, whether it's because they don't know enough about it or they haven't been able to go to church or they don't have good role models. So I think it's constantly reminding yourself that you, you know, if you accept that love, it's there and it's ready for you. Well, it's kind of like Charles was saying about it, the comfort when you look back over your life, and I can only speak for myself or for Jerry, and I think of all the different things that we've been through, the trials we've been through in life, um, you know, definitely have helped us uh, and comforted us in the worst circumstances. But then also now, you know, you have a greater appreciation for God uh, by looking, listen to the birds sing and watching the sunset and the things that sometimes we didn't take time for before. Right. And, and I, I, similar to, also similar to what Charles said, he mentioned when you, since you were baptized, you know, I was fortunate enough, even though I didn't always want to go, my mom made me go to church from the, from day one. Uh, um, I've always had that since, even though I may not have admitted it or didn't, uh, may not even realize that I had that comfort, uh, even though I did grow up in a Presbyterian church. Is that okay? In, in a what church? <laughs> Presbyterian. Uh, Pre well, Presbyterian yeah. church. <laughs> <laughs> we'll forgive you. <laughs> I converted him yeah. about 20, 20 some years ago. Yeah. All right. Yep. When people, people got up to go take communion, I was really confused, but I got used to it. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, I wanted to you know, mention something about dualism. It's a little bit of an aside. Uh, no problem. The, the author indicates that that uh, uh, was a literature, literary form at that particular era of writing. Since then, we have learned that life is more complex than that, and it's rather unfair in many cases, to make it things black and white when the world is actually a gray in gradations of gray in a world of black and white. Right. Yeah. There are very few black and white situations that I can think of today. And there are many stories on, many, on every issue or many yeah. positions of view. Right. I tell my students in psychology that everything in psychology is on a continuum because you might have um you know black and white but then like you said you have all those marks in between and um for example when we you know when we talk about someone who um, has self-confidence you have someone who has extreme self-confidence to the level of arrogance and then you have someone who has no self-confidence and then you have all those <coughs> in between and I, and I think that's exactly true. It's, it's important to remember that everything's on that continuum. Uh, uh, Charles, I think you did. Go ahead. Uh, you can go example, ahead. An example is, I've been, I am just, I've been on grand jury, actually the chairperson of grand jury for Montgomery County for a year and a half now. So the, I'm now taken off of it. But uh, what, there was one case there where you and I never met, I never, I don't know these individuals or anything at all, but I know the cases. And a young lady had gotten, had got, gotten involved with a bunch of, not necessarily hoodlums, but some that were going in the wrong direction. They weren't, none of them were really bad, but they were, had gotten in trouble to where they were interacting, having to interact with law enforcement. And they were all obviously guilty of something. But it's the one time in the whole period that I, told this, this, this lady was younger than the other males that she was associated with. And I told the witness, make sure 
that those that are involved uh, try to, to have some leniency when they start sentencing with this person and to try to find some way to encourage her to take a more positive uh, positive place because she's obviously you're starting on the wrong track and she's obviously really a good person. Right. I also think, Charles, at your earlier point, you just described the, the problem with politics. <laughs> yes. I think uh, we've got... <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, uh, I have breakfast with a bunch, and I'm the out, I'm the out, outlier of those. So I, have, I have, I have to I have a lot of patience many days. So uh, that's that's and that's okay because I can perceive where that people come from different places and people have been different places. So and seen different things. Well, we've got two primary parties. We've got one at one end of the spectrum and one at the other end. That's the way it appears. And most people are looking for some compromise or, or to land in that gray area, as you mentioned it. So uh, maybe that's what we need to do, start a third political party that's, that's in the middle. <laughs> we wouldn't be the first to try. <laughs> okay, I wanted to uh, look at the, one of the verses in the, in the uh, well, I'm sorry, not the, uh, one of the, sections oh it's um uh, well, this talks about in the world's great i want to read reread this again then ask a question this was the world's great folly and for this john says the world is under judgment the light came into the world and the people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions are evil what, what do you think he means when he says the darkness in which the light of jesus sh shines what was the what is the darkness Repeat that question. Okay. I want, I want, let me read the, the sentence again. The light came into the world, and the people loved darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. That's from John three nineteen. And the question is, what is the darkness in which the light of Jesus shines? Well, it makes me think of the young lady Charles just mentioned you know, she was surrounded by darkness, but then there was Charles and some other people who were going to try and show her that there are other, other choices, different ways. And that's what I think Jesus is when we're surrounded by negative influences and, um, you know, hardships and difficult times, there's always that light, but sometimes people don't have someone to show them the light or they don't, haven't been taught about a lot, or they haven't been dragged to church like Joseph was. <laughs> <laughs> oh. my, my childhood home was about, I don't know, three, four hundred yards from where I went to church. So after Sunday school, every Sunday, I'd say, Mom, can I walk home? Can I walk home? I, I never won that. I Very rarely did I win that battle. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to uh, con continue on. If, you, if you've got a, a book, it's on, I'm on page 30, starting with uh, your reply. And this is our reply to the words answer. The author talks about DNA testing. Has, has anybody ever had a, a, done a DNA test by mail or something like that just to learn about yourself? I've heard of that, but I've never never done it. I mean, some people will, uh, um, they want, they're trying to learn about their genetic makeup, you know, who are they related to and that sort of thing. And of course, crime, crime fighting now is using DNA. I think uh, they're, they're, Charles, you may know more about this. They're tapping, when people are submitting DNA samples to find out about themselves, the, the authorities are taking advantage of that and using it to link uh, criminals to crime scenes. I'm, I'm I just, a real Go ahead. I'm in, I'm in real trouble. I have not done that, but I have a niece who has. And so if, so my information is still out there because my niece has done so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you don't commit any crimes, Charles, and leave any <laughs> DNA behind. They may match you, be able to match you to it. Yeah. I might not want to know who some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> it might be worse than me. <laughs> If you, well, if you, if you, if you, when if you, I think sometimes 
I get mad at myself and I think, oh, man, Jesus wouldn't have done this. I should have been, a, I should be a better person. And I think God made us in his image. And when I start putting myself down, I think, am I putting God down because I'm putting myself down? I just need to do better in what I'm doing. Right. Right. Well, uh, according to the writer, John is telling us that God authorizes us to become part of God's family, to become children of God. We do not, we do have, we do have a place to belong and we do have a story and God knows more about uh, us than any DNA test. That's right. So what does it mean to become children of God? Let's start by examining how John probably understood the phrase in his time. The idea that someone could descend from a deity was common in the ancient world. This is pretty interesting. The Greeks and the Romans, for example, wrote about particularly good people as being offspring of the gods. They did not always mean, however, that that person had become divine. And there are similar concepts in the Old Testament and, and later in Jewish writings uh, during New Testament times. The Jewish people as a whole were often described in the Bible as God's children. And there was a rich appreciation of God's fatherhood to Israel. We can appreciate those concepts in our personal experiences with God. We want to belong to God, to be God's children. Perhaps you were taught as a child that you are a daughter or a son of God. It's foundational to your earliest understandings of your relationship to God. Knowing that you are a son or daughter of God is important for all children, but it can be profound for any child who has lost one or more parents to death. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to the next page. There's a, I don't know if you guys uh, have a book, read this story about the, the CEO of the Methodist Home for Children. Did you guys read that in the lesson? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how that connects to the lesson. <laughs> I don't know the author, author sometimes adds in examples that uh, I'm having a hard time connecting to the, um, to the lesson, but nonetheless, it was interesting. There was a, 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 young, a young man, I guess, I can't remember, he was an adult. They had, he was picked up in a uh, park. Uh, walk, he was walking around mutter, muttering to himself. And the poli policeman picked him up, and he really hadn't committed a crime, but he said, you know, I'll take you home. He asked him where his home was, and he said it was the Methodist home for children. So he takes the guy to the uh, Methodist home, and the, and the, and the fellow who was the president pulls up, and um, he, uh, I don't know if he recognized him, but it turns out that guy was a resident of that home when he was a teenager. So he went back home and the guy took him from there. And this, this fella had stopped taking his medication and that, that's why he had become so confused. Um, like all children of a parent, we are subject to our heavenly parents rule. Have any of you ever told one of your kids this, as long as you live under my roof, you, you gotta do by my rules? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As long as we live under God's roof, God is in charge. So only God can authorize us to become God's children. And that's the amazing news. Even though Jesus was rejected and despised, God still authorizes us to become God's children when we welcome Jesus and believe in his name. Even though we were in darkness, God sent a true light. That light shined on everyone, even though everyone did not recognize it. Many still do not recognize it today. Younger generations watch their parents and grandparents hold out for hope for a better tomorrow that never seems to come. So the young people <clears throat> resolve themselves to a future without hope. Or they toil in false hope that human ingenuity has the potential to set things right. But who gives us hope? God. God. <laughs> God gives us hope. We've been made in we've been made God's own children through the person of Jesus Christ who became flesh and made his home among us. And then he talks about the fact that we're really, when I read this, it kind of frightened me. We're only five days away from Christmas. <laughs> uh, the miracle of Christmas is this, that Jesus is born into the world he created and loves. Even though the world did not recognize it. So as you go through your Christmas traditions, 
they may be toned back this year, <laughs> but uh, remember the cosmic significance of what has happened and see how, see the light again. Give God thanks for coming into the world in the person of Jesus to set everything right. That includes making us children of God. So how does it feel to know that you are God's child? Great. Makes me feel loved and confident. Okay. Well, it was kind of like the story that even if you lose your way, you know, this, this man was in his 30s when he told him that he was from the children's home. But even if you lose your way or now, like you said, you don't feel like you've maybe done what you should have done, that you're always welcome back in the, you know, God's always still waiting for you. That unconditional love, I think, is what, you know, I'm so grateful for, is that evidence of, of God's unconditional love for all of us. Okay. All right, I guess uh, we need to wrap it up so uh, Jerry and Dottie can make it to church. <laughs> yeah, we're ready. <laughs> next, next week's lesson, the, the purpose, fa father, the Father dwells in Jesus. And the purpose statement is to proclaim that following Jesus means we have a path to follow that helps us encounter God and leads us to eternal life. And, and we'll be here. I know it's a couple of days after Christmas, but I... Um, I didn't want us to get behind because these uh, lessons are dated. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to read the prayer that's that's at the end of the, this week's text. So if, if you would bow your heads, thank you, O oh God, for shining your light on the world. Thank you, Word of God, for becoming flesh and making your home among us. By your grace, may all the world come see and believe. Amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Yes. Everybody have a good Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Everybody. Have a good week. See you well, next okay. week. Yeah. I want you new new folks that were here this week to come back next week. Uh, once you get started, you can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here. Thank you. All okay, right. great, great. We'll see you then. Have a, see good, you. have a good Christmas. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs>